After spending his formative writing years writing a mix of protest poems and confessional pieces, he now aims to look inwards to find how his environment has impacted both himself and those close to him. It gives me great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, announce our first festival commission. Please, can you be really warm in your welcome to fantastic poet, uh, Mr. Matt L.T. Smith. It's been such an honour to respond to the festival's theme of change. Um, so this is my 20 minute piece called Sclerosis. I grew up in a house built on lung cancer. Family dinners picked from tobacco fields. School clothes smelled like Nan and Grandad's house, even when I didn't visit. Even after Grandad's triple heart bypass, after sticky blood, after Nan drowned in reverse and came back with dementia. Black pudding and sticky toffee looked the same, but only if I thought about it. Pork doesn't look like pigs when I'm eating. My clothes smelled like refinery chimneys, like Nan's miracle tablets that turned oil into wine. There's a faint smell of leather on my mum's side. My clothes smelled like sweat, like hard work, like this is my house, my wife, my kids, and they all smell like cigarettes. But he would never touch the stuff. My brother would. Dad told him lungs aren't a refinery. Tar will only gum up the machine and he can't fix him. Can't listen for the rattle in his cough. Ears trained to hear the sound of broken. It sounds a lot like silence. Sundays were never quiet. My brother rolled another cigarette. Told me our clothes already stink of smoke. He's just trying to cover up the smell. I said I'll never touch the stuff. He said, you will. I didn't. Dad worked nights at the factory. We kept quiet getting ready for school. His grisly snore let us know he wasn't broken. He was working. At the factory, Dad would sit and listen to the hum of the machines. They sounded like sleigh bells, like birthday candles, like light and heat. Management said he sounded like a cost. Dad's redundancy sounded like silence and smelled of cigarettes. Stop chewing with your mouth open, my brother says, smacking lips, trying to fake talking to fill the absence of dinner conversation. We've left it all for Sunday roast. We need substance for stuffing, so we spend the week talking around sound until it rolls home on Sunday. On Sunday, I end up stuck behind my bedroom door, wedged shut with newspaper columns and small talk with the volume up. Dad tells me to turn it down. I tell him I can hear Star Wars through the floor, even the prologue drifting across the screen, the sound of yellow creaking through my floorboards. Yellow never looks so regal, an off-brand gold for incomprehensive pencil cases stretched out against the deep, dark nothing. The silence that we aspire to, back when trade negotiations still hit an interesting narrative note. Or maybe they never did. Maybe that's why we can't get the news cycle right. My brother taught me how to throw myself into sound. Crank it loud enough and you can drown Sunday out. A guitar can cry for you, a song can speak for you. You don't have to stay silent because you're not moving your mouth. I can only play alley cats, all twisted tales and late night brawls with puddles, trying to splash myself with myself, then hissing because that alley cat soaked me. So I kept chewing with my mouth open, started chewing in front of microphones and calling it poetry. <laughs> when someone asked what the words were, I said, I've saved them all for Sunday. We're just eating tonight, no talking. I got the whistling noise the landing light makes stuck in my ear after a gig. Dad told me to turn it down. Too many men get tinnitus from the sound of their own voice when the reaction to being turned down is cranking the volume back up and pulling the knob off. But Dad, I promise, I didn't say a word. 
I learned from you. I let the silence speak for me. The first thing the urban explorers notice when they enter the abandoned beehive is the absence of buzzing. The drones have gone, left behind their concrete hexagons, shutter bugs to ruin porn, the explorers flash their cameras, they capture the absence. They capture green on yellow, nature leaking through the honeycomb. Looking at the gaps in their photographs, the explorers wonder what happened. Why did this colony collapse? Smoke no longer billows from the chimney, no longer puts them down to sleep. The beekeepers have left, and so have all the bees. When I was little, there was a bush in the garden that always had bees hovering around it. We called it the bee bush. Every summer, they would come out and buzz their hellos. One summer, I captured one of the bees in a jar with my brother. We watched him bounce around behind the glass. I was too scared to let him free. He died in the jar. I trod on a bee next to the bush barefoot after climbing out of the paddling pool. He stung me. He died. I wouldn't stop wailing as mum pulled the stinger out of my heel. I wonder if he knew what we did to his brother. After that, the bees disappeared. I haven't seen a bee near the bush since. We still call it the bee bush. I wonder if they still call dad's factory a factory. After Nan passed away, we collected up all the things her dementia brain tried to remind us. Motorbikes in black and white, my five-year-old face taking a bite into her golden wedding anniversary cake before it's even sliced, teeth smushing into the icing, face screwing up at the realisation that it's not chocolate. <laughs> I asked Nan and Grandad if I could be in the picture when they cut the cake with my stomach in my forehead. When the family said cheese, I remembered I was hungry. <laughs> In the museum of Nan and Grandad were stacks of paper, bills, letters, proof of life. In amongst the papers, mixed in with the gas and electric, was a poem written by my Nan's Grandad. Mum's great granddad, my great, great granddad. Rhymes written in the accent my mother lost. The accent that cooed from the corner of Nan's kitchen, sat in her chair in front of the cupboard stocked with sugar puffs, with a cigarette hanging out of her mouth, as I pretended a lemon squeezer was a spaceship in the absence of toys. I realised, whilst reading great-great-granddad's poem, that redundancy is the family curse. He, like me, concerned himself with the men who for years idle stood with nothing for clothes and little for food. The men whose kids' physiques grew lower and lower as if gravity was conspiring against them after the shoe factory shut down in Cockermouth. The factory where my nan used to work for the conditions did her lungs in. I wonder if she ever went back entered her granddad's poem. If the oxygen fled her brain because it remembered that factory air and tried to will it back into existence, tried to be her granddad's angel who would save the brave people from hunger and cold. Her tobacco lungs had already tried hard enough to breathe my dad's factory back into existence. I wonder if great-great-granddad ever wondered if his great-great-grandson would be writing about the same thing 84 years later, over 300 miles south, our stories only separated by time and distance. Or maybe only Nan realised that time is that cyclical. I should have pretended the lemon squeezer was a time machine rendered myself four-dimensionally jet-lagged, given myself whiplash from looking back. It's not like a writer's body club could get any worse. I wonder if great-great-granddad was the same. I wonder if he wrote his poem out of time, like I would. 
all it would take is a lemon squeezer to ask him. I wish I could have put Nan's memories in the lemon squeezer, squashed everything sour out of them, given Mum a happy childhood to relive on the days that Nan thought Mum was a kid again. I wish I could put all our childhoods in the lemon squeezer, juice the silence out, get the machine humming again. But I'm face planting a cake forever. It's always tastes of jam, never chocolate. When a machine breaks down, like when Nan's ram gave out, like when my eye went quiet, look for the best ears. Don't trust mine. I would say it sounds like you're working, that I recognize the hum, but that buzzing noise has been there a while. Maybe I'm always working. Maybe I work from bed with my eyes closed. Maybe I don't want to look. I asked Dad to listen. He says I'm probably fine. He says it's all in my head. He reminds me I don't work. For someone whose job was to listen, he's a bad therapist. But technically, his diagnosis is right. It is in my head. I can feel it in my eye. I tried to Google my way out of a paper bag. Inhale. Watch the walls constrict until nose is pressed against headless chicken-scratched hieroglyphs. I trust my self-misdiagnosis when I write it down. When my left eye peeps it through glitches and static CRT TV screens, bad signal isn't just a lie I tell to hang up the phone. It's a summer's day. It's a hot shower. It's a walk in the park. It's searching my symptoms and finding a tumour. Crying on my 21st birthday before tearing off the wrapping paper to an electric piano. I've always wanted to learn the piano, but only boys cry after. Men overcome phone anxiety, impersonate a broken metronome to the voice on the other end, worked over by a butcher's mallet, not a hint of leather on her. She says, we won't make you come in on your birthday. The next day, I tell the nurse my left eye is a thermometer. It's the window with the back seat and the kids won't stop fogging it up. They write as much as I do. The doctor makes me premature again, consigned to the incubator with translucent skin made of film reel, of his blank face with no context, cut. He flips a coin into the void. I won't know if it's heads or tails until it hits bottom, until the chime echoes upward, cutting through the music, poaching the ivories from my fingertips. That's the price of my new superpower. I'm still waiting for the day having a thermometer for an eye comes in handy. Mum was a civil servant. She worked for the Department of Work and Pensions back when it was still the Department of Social Security. To this day, she still calls it the DSS, but blood pumping nostalgia for when we cared about security. Now it's work for those that can bureaucracy for those that can't. Mum was there with me in the eye hospital when they said the words multiple sclerosis, optic neuritis, 50-50 chance, a 50-50 chance of bureaucracy, and that's without considering my anxiety. Every one in two of me takes the journey to the assessment, pops codeine into my mouth, takes more than the recommended amount to get through the day. Painkillers don't really kill pain, they just make it invisible. Walking national insurance number, quota, target. I step through the door of the job center. Even when face to face I'm opaque, living translucent, still that premature sprout letting the sun go through him. They see right through me. I see right through them. I would try to see mum in stony faces, mum who will perch on the edge of my beds, hold my hand and wait for my mind to be quiet when the panic got to me. 
Mum, who despite my dad's insistence that I was too old for fluffy toys, still put that reindeer in my Christmas stocking when I was nine, so I would have something to hold my hand when she couldn't. Mum would sit behind a desk and try to build a bridge across the chasm, stop them from falling into the drawer, from getting lost amongst all the other numbers. I wonder if I asked nicely if they would let Mum assess me or find someone that at least looks like her just to take the stress off. I would try to pretend she's Mum. I would hold my reindeer's hand as she repeats the government motto, work sets you free, as she tells me that if you don't work, by definition, that makes you broken. Then I'll give Dad a stethoscope, ask him if he can find sound in me, and when he hears my heartbeats, I'll tell my surrogate mum that I'm not broken. Then she'll declare me fit to work. Sclerosis means excessive resistance to change. The word fit me better than a hospital gown. No breeze up my back before it was even a hypothetical in my doctor's notes. Sclerosis is still living in my hometown. Sclerosis is watching my walls melt into all of the scenery of my summer. This whole country is sclerosis, hardening, drinking cement, unable to speak through concrete, spines braced like reinforcing steel until all our kids wear hard hats, exploring the abandoned factories that are their dads, spines rusted into poppies, not knowing whether to grow or turn into brick dust. We watch the spray tanned carrots in M&S commercials, faking exposure, cracks in the concrete. They pretend they're just as rusty as we are, as they point to those who are shiny to these lands, who haven't seen the rain yet. But we know gilded when we see it. Grab the finger, scratch the orange paint off. Sclerosis is wanting childhood to last forever to go back to when my brother and I were kids, when we would take newspapers out onto the patio on a summer's day and hold a magnifying glass over people's faces, burn holes in their eyes. Someone, somewhere, has a photo of me. They're holding a magnifying glass to my left eye. I feel like I've drank the, con the cement, concrete labouring my every breath, as if I've swallowed all the cigarettes. I reach for the soft touch, hold my reindeer's hand. I can't feel it. Mum perches on the edge of my bed, like she did when I was a kid. I tell her, I can't live in a world without Braille. Thank you.